Shannon Watts, I want to ask you first. You've okay. been organizing voters since 2012. Do those numbers in the Fox News poll that I just read extensively surprise you? They don't. <laughs> you know, I think we talk about this as though it's a polarizing issue in America. But in fact, the vast majority of Americans have and continue to believe that stronger gun laws make us safer, that the Second Amendment can go, in ha go hand in hand with responsibilities. I think this polling is very bad news for the gun lobby, but it's very good news for public safety. You know, we have known for a long time this is not a red or blue issue. This is a life or death issue. And more and more Americans are going to the polls and they're voting on this issue because they don't believe their families or their communities are safe. And let's make no mistake, you know, what we saw in places like Tennessee and other legislatures run by MAGA Republicans is the fact that there is this toxic stew of gerrymandering, of racism, of gun extremism. And it is ensuring that there are more guns in more places, resulting in more gun violence and more gun death. Mm -hmm. And Representative mm -hmm. Pearson, that poll taken after Covenant, not even a year after Uvalde, have you seen minds changed on the ground? I don't know if as many minds have changed from the Republican Party after the tragic Nashville Covenant shooting as the perspective has changed. But there is thousands, there are thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of children and teenagers and young people and parents who are advocating for sensible gun reform, and they're not going away. Whether they be Republicans or Democrats, the moral problem that we have about whether this is right or wrong is being answered by the people who are supposed to be getting represented. And we are saying that it is right for kids to go to school and be able to come home. It is right for kids to be able to go to a bank and come home and for people to go and live their lives normally without the fear of gun violence. It is wrong for the NRA and the Tennessee Firearms Association to have a hold on politicians. It is wrong for people's money to be determining the public policy of a state like Tennessee. And so I am hopeful that some people are really realizing the power of this movement in this moment. Mm -hmm. Senator Gutierrez, you introduced a bill to raise the age limit to purchase certain weapons, making Texas the 10th state to do so. The question is, do you have the Republican votes needed to pass the bill? Well, actually, Jonathan, we have an age limit on handguns. Uh, unfortunately, we have no such age limit on, on long rifles like AR-15s, mm -hmm. which makes absolutely no sense. Our bill in the Senate hasn't really moved much. The House bill has finally got a committee hearing. It seems to have uh, found uh, some obstacles, and we've got to keep pushing forward. The families from Uvalde aren't going to stop. They're not going to stop fighting for justice. I'm not going to stop fighting for justice uh, I'm so proud of everything that Justin and his colleagues have done in Tennessee, even getting Bill Lee to acknowledge that, extreme, that you need extreme risk protective orders. Texas seems to be the last state to the dance. These Republicans don't want to do anything in this state to protect our children. Well, speaking of Uvalde families, Senator, your bill and others like it have the support of Uvalde families. And Kimberly Matarubio, who lost her daughter in Uvalde, told legislators in the Texas House, quote, had this bill been the law in the state of Texas one year ago, the gunman would not have been able to purchase a semi-automatic weapon he used to murder our daughter. Our hearts may be broken, but our resolve has never been stronger. Senator, are there pleas to back stronger gun reform bills having any impact on Republicans in your state? Well, because of their hard work, they managed to get a hearing in the House of Representatives. It's a, it's a shame that the lieutenant governor will not do so in the Senate. But the families are resolute, and they're going to keep moving forward to find justice here. Um, it's important to know that what happened in Uvalde, it, you know, we have to look at these things, and they don't happen in a vacuum. All of that failure that the entire nation saw, we have to understand that when we're also talking about gun violence and the additional loss of life that happened when you had all of these good guys with guns, children still died. Mm -hmm. Representative Pearson, Axios is reporting Tennessee lawmakers probably won't return to the legislature to consider gun reforms until after July 4th. The Republican supermajority has historically been against gun restrictions. Do you think this time it'll be different? You know, this time it must be different. The reality is this movement of people uh, is not going away and is not being silenced. And it is good to see the governor make some steps, but it's not nearly enough. 
We need to have risk protection orders. We need to have an age limit on rifles. We need to ban assault weapons in our state. There's so much that we can do to make sure not only schools are safer, but our communities are safer so that we don't have to go to funerals as I had to go with my own classmate, Larry Thorne, earlier this year because of gun violence. We are living in a gun violence epidemic, and we have to take much more serious action as legislatures, particularly at the state level, to do something about this, to stop this violence from happening. And I'm hopeful that in Tennessee, we're going to see not just one law, but several laws passed that actually make our community safe rather than these false solutions of arming uh, teachers and arming security guards, things that we know will not have a serious impact in our communities. Well, more on that, Representative Pearson, since your reinstatement, have you spoken to any of your Republican colleagues about gun reforms? My Republican colleagues have not broached the subject of real gun reform. The only things that they've talked about is more arming teachers, making it... Uh, so that people between the ages of 18 and 20 could be able to have a gun. Uh, however, I have seen some statements that folks are willing to go into a special session uh, with uh, the governor's bill uh, to amend it in some ways. And, and again, I believe people are seeing that this moment, this fusion movement uh, of both black folks, white folks, rich folks, and poor folks uh, who are paying attention to the epidemic that we're experiencing because of the proliferation of guns and the bad policies is going to create positive change in our country. Shannon Watts, what do you say to people who don't understand the disconnect between the policies that are passed and what the public actually wants? When you have conversations about this with everyday Americans, with your family and friends, you realize that you have more in common than you don't on this issue. It is these gun extremists that we've elected to state legislatures or even in Congress who are standing in the way a forward movement. But I want to be clear, we're making huge progress on this issue. We have passed over 500 good gun laws in the last decade. We've stopped the NRA's agenda 90% of the year in state houses for the last eight years in a row. Um, we are educating people about secure gun storage, changing this issue legislatively, electorally, and culturally. In fact, 100 of our 40 of our own volunteers ran for office and won this last election cycle. So huge progress is being made, but obviously, we need more people to get off the sidelines and use their voices and votes on this issue. Um, I would encourage people who want to get involved in our Mother's Day action to text the word FED UP to 64433. We have to show our lawmakers that there will be consequences for inaction. You know, Representative Pearson, let me get one more question into you before I go to Senator Gutierrez. Let me read you something my colleague David Brooks over on PBS uh, wrote in The New York Times today. He wrote, Biden talks a lot talks a lot about the struggle between democracy and authoritarianism at its deepest level. That struggle is between systems that put the dignity of individual souls at the center and systems that operate by the logic of dominance and submission. You met with President Biden this week. What do you make of that? I believe David Brooks is right um, in talking with President Biden and Vice President uh, Kamala Harris. I believe they, too, recognize that what we are seeing at the state legislatures is the erosion of our democracy uh, by expelling lawmakers who you disagree with. Now in Montana, silencing lawmakers who are seeking to advocate for those uh, who have been pushed to the margins in the periphery and, and bring their voices to the center. We are seeing a, a really uh, a scary time in our American history with the erosion of our democracy and an assault on our democracy instead of real attention on issues that really can help people, uh, focused on health care, eradicating poverty, things that we know government can do if it focused on caring for the last, the lost, and those made least. But instead, we're seeing real uh, authoritarian and, and really anti-democratic behavior from leaders in our houses, like Speaker Cameron Sexton in Tennessee, uh, who's silencing members and who, who protects, he literally protected someone who had committed sexual assault against a 19-year-old intern uh, at the same time that he was expelling us for advocating uh, for the ban of assault weapons. Mm -hmm. it, we must preserve our democracy by advocating on behalf of the people who have been oppressed. And, and I believe uh, uh, Mr. Brooks is right. Uh, Senator Gutierrez, we, we all now know the police were afraid to go into the classroom at Robb Ele Elementary. Are any law enforcement officers saying privately that they don't want to face those kinds of weapons on the street? Would that make a difference in a red state? Well, Jonathan, I've seen hundreds of hours of body cam footage, and I've seen all of the exit interviews. 
the police were absolutely afraid in their exit interviews. They were absolutely afraid of the AR-15. The, the speed of that bullet goes three times as much as any other regular pistol. The kind of bullets that this young man used uh, turned back on themselves and tore through these little babies, uh, just obliterating their, bo their bodies. It, America needs to understand that we're in a real crisis here, that we're really broken here, and that the Republican Party has truly made our community more dangerous. Let's be very clear here. The access and the proliferation of weapons in our country by the Republican Party have made our communities more dangerous. And Senator Gutierrez, as we approach the one year since um, the mass shooting at Rob Elementary, tell us about the families and how they're doing. You know, it's been very hard, Jonathan. I've, I've, um, I'm so proud to be their friend. I'm so glad that they brought me into their lives. I'm so, you know, I love these people. They're the strongest people I've ever met in my life. I don't know that I could do it. Um, I, I just, the whole thing is just the most horrific thing you could ever imagine. If you have children, um, it just breaks your heart. And I'm just glad to be part of, of, their, of their world. Um, we just got to give them a lot of love and a lot of support and understand that this could happen to any one of us. And we've got to, we've got to change things. We're broken in this country. We have to change this now. Professor Middlemass, let's start with the point made in that Washington Post piece. Describe the talent and drive that makes Vice President Harris a key part of this reelection campaign. Well, she is, first of all, talented, and she has been elected at the local, state, and national level. She is not new to politics. She, of course, ran her own uh, presidential election um, campaign before. Uh, withdrawing to then be nominated as Biden's vice president. She is an important component is because she is reflective of America. She energizes the voting base of the Democratic Party, black women. But more importantly, is she energizes young voters. Um, and that I think any detraction from her past as a prosecutor is now in the rearview mirror because she now has a record of 30 months or so being vice president, representing the nation, as you mentioned in your opening, across 17 nations. Um, she's been across the country giving speeches. She energizes crowds. And I think that will translate into a positive outcome in 2024 for the Biden-Harris ticket. And, and Professor Greer, you know, Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley, who's previously called for a competency test for any politician older than 75, said this on Fox News. I'm going to quote, if you vote for Joe Biden, you really are counting on a President Harris because the idea that he'd make it until 86 years old is not something that I think is likely. What in the entire Professor Greer, what what should the Biden Harris counter to that messaging be? Well, yeah, Jonathan, we know that the Republican Party is going to come out with, obviously, a lot of ageist uh, tactics. It's no surprise from Nikki Haley, because she needs to say that to detract from her uh, lack of record. But I think the Biden-Harris administration needs to stick to the facts. Uh, look at all the wins that they've had these past few months, you know, the policies, the money that they've uh, put towards helping Americans, you know, the fact that they are not trying to move this country towards fascism, the fact that they are thinking about the environment or a woman's right to choose and framing it as such, not as these, you know, sort of um, base level pro-life arguments, which is not what it is. You know, really thinking about education and gun control and all these issues that actually matter to usually two thirds of Americans. And, you know, the Republican Party right now is out of step with the vast majority of Americans and what they want as far as public mm -hmm. opinion and policy. And so when we think about the ageist arguments, we do know that the Republican Party will try and scare their voters essentially to say, if you you know, deviate from us, you'll essentially be putting a black woman in charge of this nation. And so the, the Biden-Harris administration really does need to just stay the course and really think more about policy and the pocketbook issues that they've provided for Americans that will drive mm -hmm. them to the polls. And Professor Mino Mass, NBC News is reporting that the White House wants to elevate Harris's work heading into 2024. A person familiar with the conversations inside the White House said, and I want to quote, they know she is a target and the attacks have always been intense and the ante is going to be upped. 
So they want to make sure she is on the best possible footing. I was going to ask, how, how do they do that? But it seems to me that sort of the, the times are doing that between the attacks on reproductive rights, the anti-small-D Democratic things that are happening in Tennessee and now in Montana, mass shootings. The, time, the, the vice president and the times are meeting. Is that how they do that? Quite frankly, it's the, the Biden-Harris administration and, and Vice President Harris in particular, just to stay on track. Um, they're doing a fabulous job. They have to just stay on message, but also be prepared for the racist and misogynistic attacks that are bound to increase in um, frequency, but also in the, the speed of them. Um, there will be undercurrents on social media, the national... Um, the national rags, for lack of a better description, will attack her. And so if the Harris, the, the Biden-Harris team literally have to be ready for those attacks, but they also, as you mentioned, is they just have to say, and oh, by the way, we are for reproductive rights and we are for LGBTQ plus rights. And we do believe in protecting the environment. And oh, by the way, we also believe in gun control. I mean, it's, it's really as simple as talking about policies that Americans ma um, care about that really matter in the day-to-day -day lives and then have the um, outside of the White House doing those attacks against the GOP, um, bring, bring forth up and coming, but also the statesmen of the Democratic Party to make sure that, that any attacks against Harris in particular are then countered in an effective way. And Professor Greer, aren't the tax uh, uh, against uh, Vice President Harris, particularly by Republicans, actually a, a sign of her strength because they know if they don't hobble her now, and by now I mean since day one of the administration, that they know how far she can go? Yeah, I mean, we, we do also know, we need to be realistic, Jonathan, though, you know, we've never had a black female governor in this country. You know, we've only had two mm -hmm. black female senators. Um, Kamala Harris was one. You know, there is something in the intersectionality of race and gender when it comes to black women in leadership mm -hmm. that sort of makes certain people apoplectic. I think what the Republican Party most likely will try and do is chip away at black male voters and try and sort of double down in her time as DA or attorney general uh, and, and really exacerbate certain parts of her resume and really not think about the evolution that most politicians have, either moving from the middle to the left or the middle to the right. And I do think, you know, we, if we get an honest conversation about Kamala Harris, we have seen an evolution of her as a politician into the role of vice president, which has never been defined. Every vice president has a different role, as we've seen from Dick Cheney to Al Gore and, you know, all the others, <laughs> you know, Mike Pence um, and Joe Biden, who served, you know, Barack Obama uh -huh. sort of loyally for eight years. So I do think that, you know, part of the attacks that Keisha laid out, you know, will also um, be to sort of chip away at sort of uh, moderate to moderate Democrats, especially black men specifically, and try and distort her record from her time when she was attorney general and district attorney in California.